All right. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. You know, um, wherever you are joining from, um, I'm I'm Bhaskar, um, joining from Noida, India, and it's almost you know 9:20 p.m. right now. And uh, today I'll be talking about 11 must-know libraries for the .NET developers. You know what actually happens um, when people they are pretty much engaged in you know uh, focusing on the delivery part. Um, they are forgetting and they are actually missing a lot of different things, which essentially should be there. And that's how we are here to you know, discuss on this on the Code Quality Conference. So let's uh, start with this. Um, all right. So this is my intro slide. If you want to connect with me, um, my name is Bhaskar. I'm almost having a 20 years of experience in industry. And I'm Chief Strategy Officer at Engine Solutions. So if you wish to connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn, these are my QR code. You can you know, go ahead and connect it. All right. So uh, what we will be talking about, all those 11, let me list down all those. So these are the 11 libraries. Um, pretty much, you know, um, people, they may heard about it or not. Uh, the first one is Swagger. The other one is the Dapper, Automapper, Nlog, Newtonsoft, JSON, Fluent Validation, Benchmark.net, Mini Profiler, Mock, Poly, and SignalR. So why we are saying that these are the essential and must know libraries because um, all these different libraries has their own significant, uh, you know, the importance wherever you are using, you know, uh, it could be console application, it could be web application, it could be, you know, uh, the APIs you are writing. So wherever you feel like to you know add it you you please you know go ahead and implement all those let's talk about the first one swagger so uh, what is swagger swagger is basically you know open source tool based on the api uh, open api specification and uh, when we are writing our own apis right it, it very well document it and when i say the document it means you know it it defines everything about the API. Uh, I'll talking about more onto this, and uh, uh, it does connect with the remote server and validate the logic. So, what your API does is, you know, that's a, a published, and now front end developer they are ready to consume it. Um, but how to validate it? So, unless you connect that front end with that API, you really can't do it. But you know, Swagger gives that flexibility uh, so that you can run that API and validate it. I mean, the, there are different tools of it, like Postman and everything. Uh, you can do it, but Swagger is something which is uh, implemented and, uh, you know, um, incorporated within the code. So it wouldn't be, you know, difficult for you to, you know, check the APIs as and when they are, uh, you know, ready. And uh, it generates the client library also uh, using the code gen. It generates almost, you know, over the 40 different client side languages. And uh, that helps you to, you know, verify the um, <coughs> APIs. All right. So why Swagger? <coughs> um, first of all, um, I mean, we are talking about the full stack developers, but sometimes what happens, the front end developers, they are different. The APIs developers are different. So whenever APIs has been published or created, you know, the person, the API person, they are describing each and everything about that API to the front end developer so that they can, you know, easily go and consume them. And uh, while, you know, um, consuming all those things, there are certain issues coming up because of the lack of communication, lack of you know understanding of the API and many other things. So if Swagger will document each and every API, um, nobody has to go and tell them, you know, what does uh, what this API does. So it is very easy to understand, easy to uh, see what this API does. You can go ahead and implement it. Second is um, it very well describes the structure of API, right? So um, like, you know, what are the parameters, you know, and uh, how uh, the things, uh, what are the parameters and their data types, how you can, you know, post it across. Um, what are the operations that API support that you can also see? Like, you know, do, do we have a different verbs? Even if I, you know, 
have one API and give it to the front end developer, <clears throat> he may not be able to understand, okay, this is a get API, this is a post API. So that verbiage will be not, uh, will not be there. So the, all those verbs is very well defined over there in this documentation. And uh, as I said, you know, it also says that what all parameters it takes and how the values are getting written from those APIs. Right. And uh, um, if there is any bearer token or anything is required, that also tells you how that authorization is required in this. Uh, it also runs that API on behalf of you. So that is what I was asking, you know, before even connecting with UI, um, you can run those APIs and validate the logic. And of course, uh, there is a big community support on this Swagger. So you should go ahead and, you know, check this out and implement it now how um and i will quickly do one thing is just uh show you how this swagger works how you can do it so i'm gonna open visual studio um yeah okay so this is on the other screen create a new project um ASP.NET Core Web API, next, next. Sorry, I did web application one only. Right. Askar, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you planning to share your screen too? The one that you're working on? Oh, yeah. Uh, is it not visible? At this instance, you're sharing your application. You need to share your screen. Stop sharing your presentation. Or you need to come back to StreamYard. Click on present, share screen. And select the third tab that you have at the top. First is Chrome tab, Window, then Entire Screen is the third tab, and then select Present, the Share a Screen, Share a Screen. Mm -hmm. Then there are three tab. tabs: Window yeah. and then Entire Screen. You need to entire select screen. Entire Screen here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thanks a lot. So, is it visible? Uh, we we still see your presentation. <clears throat> you, you'll have to move that VS Code over here, probably drag over here yeah, yeah. now okay. you see it all right they it's gone it. perfect and maybe just all zoom right. in a bit. uh it's full screen okay perfect all right thank you seven so i just you know open up one web api application and without doing anything without making any changes i just hit that debug And it will run, build succeeded. And this is what I see as an, you know, um, the output. So you see that, you know, nowadays, you know, by default, the Swagger has been implemented in all those web, um, API projects. Uh, but you, you can, you know, further um, customize it. So what you can see this verb get weather forecast and uh, how uh, there is no parameter, but if you are adding any parameter, this, uh, those will be displayed here. Um, how the example value or a schema will be you know, given over there. So this is also uh, given here. But if you want to customize it, you can still go ahead and customize it. This is web application one, but if I would go and uh, Oh, gen code. See, in program.cs, I have just I'm just replacing this swagger right here. So this is a ready code. So I made that title as a sample API docs, right? And uh, now let's run it again. And Simon, please help me out over there. Like, you know, I have 11 things to talk and uh, possibly, you know, three minutes for each. If I'm exceeding, you know, just ping me up. All right, what happens? All right, so this is the project. I have to go project. Properties, 
take some time build output generate a file containing api documentation i did this stop it and continue once again all right so um okay so this is what we have done right so the first part is done let's talk about quickly moving to the second one which is a dapper um okay so what is dapper so basically you know we already you know talked about uh, uh, i mean uh, we have heard about the orm but uh, dapper is something which is a micro orm object relational mapping and why we are saying this is a micro orm because it doesn't do many thing as the a full fledged orm does um, but it is very easy and convenient and fast moving you know the tool uh, which is helpful for your application to be you know um, get connected through the database and you know posting it and getting it back and everything so this is what the um, dapper does let me go to the other one yeah so as i said you know this is open source now why is dapper is this is a lightweight and fast very high performing and uh, uh, basically you know um, easy to use and drastically reduces the database access code every time we have to write our own code uh, uh, we have to write our own set of libraries to you know communicate with the database but that challenges and that everything can be reduced using the dapper and uh, why you should be going with this because you may have a sql server you may have oracle or sqlite or mysql or postgres so you can you can use dapper in any of these uh, database um, the good thing is that you know the dapper also supports both synchronous and asynchronous queries it does many things like batching multiple queries uses the parameterized queries to avoid you know the sql injections and um, if you have already you know one of the application which has a database connection so this is good and optimal choice for using it all right so here is a quick implementation of dapper so uh, i'm not going to implement it once again but rather i will be opening up an application which is already um, has implementation of all those things so let's talk about this dapper and uh, controller product controller so i have a mvc um project so this is the controller and controller basically you know um i have one of the api uh, okay where is it apple all right so how does it do okay so yeah so um see this a uh, result equal to await the uh, connection dot query first dot default async so this is a dapper method um i don't have to do anything rather you know i just have to pass the procedure name uh the parameter values and the um command over there i mean the, what is the command type and then everything will be done so i actually have a trouble connecting with my database but you know i can show it to you how it works so let's run it i'm once again on the same api i'm choosing one of them which is api product try it out putting product name anything like um let's say shirt um our description this is a white shirt and earrings clothing all right so let's execute and let me check if we have that breakpoint okay all set correct 
All right. So this is our controller method. You know, um, if I hover over there, this is product clothing. This is white shirt and shirt. It goes here. And uh, see this add update product. So basically, you know, it takes everything from here. Um, oh, all right. Yeah. F11. So it will throw an exception because, you know, I have a database connection issue, but uh, what this will do, you know, this will actually uh, post your data and, you know, get the first or default value. So what is first or default? Uh, if you have any record defined it, that will come. Otherwise, the default value, default record will be um, returning from this. Fine. So I'm avoiding it. This just uh, is an exception. Let's go back to our slide. OK. Yeah. So this was the dapper. Let's talk about the auto mapper. So what is the auto mapper? So auto mapper is, again, you know, the um, that is a dotted library which will map from one object to the other. So when I'm saying the map from one object to other, uh, why we need it? The question arises. But uh, you may be having uh, some situations where, you know, um, uh, your database objects and your UI objects, they both are different or maybe similar, but you don't want to, you know, push through the database object directly to the UI. So you can have that mapping over there, right? So this is the library auto mapper, which actually maps one object to the another object. So it is similar like ORM object relational mapping. Rather, it is an object to object mapping, OOM. So, why auto mapper? Um, this maps the object automatically, and uh, this the image actually depicts everything. So, being a developer, you already know that you know you have a DTO classes, you have a non DTO classes employee. Uh, so, if you have a employee class with the members' name, salary, address, department. The similar kind of class you may have with the uh, data transformation objects, which is employee DTO here. And I'm keeping the same name, name, salary, address, and department, right? So when I will be using this auto mapper, what it does, what it will do, uh, it will automatically, you know, map each and every member from one to other. And why it is essential? Because uh, when Think about it, um, you have a object and uh, the, your product is evolving. You may have to keep, you know, adding more things on those classes. So your members may grow or reduce. So sometimes some of the members, they are obsolete. So what do you need? You don't need to go back again and again and map one by one. So that actually avoid refactoring of your code whenever your members are being added or removed. That saves a lot of your maintenance time. So as image says, uh, your database object name is directly mapped with your other database name. It should be equal. But even though they are not matching, it can be customized. And I'll show you how this can be customized. This is uh, some part of the code, the uh, code piece, which is saying that you can configure it. Uh, configure it and um, these are the two lines which is highlighted in yellow for members this is the destination if your destination member is full name your source is name you can still map it but you have to explicitly say this or define it in your configuration otherwise it will always look for um, you know the same name objects if uh, they will not find it the other object name um, value will be null. All right. So let's see how does it look auto mapper. I'm going back again, you know, this product controller, you see this um, add update product DTO. This is the product object. 
and now after doing it this is the auto mapper i'm um, you know adding it which converts from this product object to add update product and uh, i'll just show you how these uh, um, models are looks like okay this is the add update product and this is the add update um, sorry get product okay Let's run it once again. All right, I'm using the same API. Try it out. Tap. Good cap. All right, so execute. You see this? So this product is, um, if you see the values are cap, good cap and cap. Uh, after mapping it, I need to run this through and then it will show me. It is uh, so that uh, that model is now transferred into this model. Cap, good cap, and cap. So as you know, I have um, database connection issue. Um, this suffice here, like you know how you can do it using the auto mapper, right? Hope that clears. All right. So let's go to the fourth one. And Simon, please you know keep informing me if I'm running behind the time or on the time or something. Yeah, All right, so uh, next is 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. I'll, I'll try to wrap it up soon. So, uh, N log. Um, why, what is N log? N log is again, you know, the open source logging libraries. Uh, you can go to the NuGet and search for nlog.web.asp.netcode. Uh, that will give you the library and you can use it. And why and log? So being a developer, every time you know it, it's not happening all the time that you wrote your uh, code, and uh, it works very well. Sometimes it is very important to have the loggings in between. What are the different values are moving ahead from one place to other? So that's how the logging is very important, and and log comes into the picture. So um, how you can use it, like. Why use uh, why and log? These are some other features, um, which gives a simple and flexible APIs to log the messages, and it has a very easy and uh, easy tracking and diagnosis feature where you can go um, and search for maybe the info, maybe the errors, maybe you know um, uh, any other uh, type of the logging messages. It also, you know, targets the um, logging into the different area. Um, it could be log. It could log into the file. It could log into any database. It could send an email or anything else, right? And uh, as I said, you know, it has advanced feature. You can go ahead and filter it. It does, you know, that uh, hierarchical logging. It it is also logging to multiple targets, right? It's very easy, highly configurable, and you know, integrated with different, different dotted logging frameworks too. And uh, to implementation of this, install package and log web.asp.co. And uh, this config file has to be added in your proper place. All right. So let's see if we have a log. How that code looks like, I can show you there. Okay, here you go. So after doing all those implementation, so you can write it over there. Again, um, this says that logger.log info, something went wrong. I can change it to anything. All right. And when I will run, it will actually log 
um, it will log this message in my file. Um, I I have a write permission issue over there, so this file will not be you know, uh, gonna create it. But this is the syntax you can easily go ahead and write it down. All right, so moving to the next Newton soft JSON. All right, what is Newton soft JSON? Uh, again, you know, when I'm talking about all those open source and .NET libraries, it is one of them and very essential and uh, useful. People they they are using it on and off uh, or very frequently, in fact. So go to the NuGet and find it out the Newton soft JSON, and uh, it gives uh, you know the methods to convert dotted types into the JSON types. I mean, vice versa, you can do it. And why Newton soft JSON? Because it has a very good serializer or deserializer methods. It converts link you to JSON. So all these objects, J object, J array, J values. Everything you know, uh, they helps you a lot to you know converting link you into the JSON, and uh, it has a JSON path, so you can you know traverse the entire structure using the XPath like syntaxes. High performance, easy to use. It has the XML support too. It runs everywhere, um, almost everywhere. When I say you know that it belongs to Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Mono, and Xamarin, and that's a pretty much you know the popular .NET library. And this is the implementation. Um, you can go ahead and install package Microsoft ASP.NET Core MVC Newton Soft. And we have to add this line in your program.cs. So let's take a quick look of uh, JSON dot. Okay. I'm setting up this as a run startup project. All right, so so you see this. I I, um, I have a program which is saying the get data, and I have a product uh, uh, class. Product class has these four members: name, expiry date, price, size, and uh, <clears throat> here I just you know serialized it once and deserialized it once and uh, showing the output in the console application. So this is the console output, right? So the first one is the serialized object. You already had it, right? So this is the product class and the members. And the second one is the deserialized object. So I just took up one of the members access over there. So see this deserialized object, deserialized product dot name. And that's how I can see it. So this is pretty much, you know, a very useful and easy to use um, library in the .NET uh, uh, <clears throat> frameworks. All right. So I'm just running and moving fast because I have running out. Of, I have less time to cover everything. So next is fluent validation. Um, okay. So as name <clears throat> depicted like validation. Oh, what does it do? Uh, it actually validates your input. So let's say if I have a model and uh, out of that model 10 members, three of them are required field. And uh, if somebody is not passing it through, um, it should raise an error. But you know how this will be showing it and how to implement it, I'll tell you. So fluent validation is again, you know, the free to use dotted library. And uh, in NuGet, you can easily go and find it out fluent validation, uh, fluent validation .asp .net code. And uh, that also works with the external model that you don't have any access to, right? And why you should be using fluent validation? Because uh, when we are writing our models, we are actually putting up our validations right over there. But in fluent validation, you can have separate fluent uh, classes and uh, define it the validation over there so it is uh, it is basically you know separating your models and your uh, validation logic so in fact it will increase your uh, throughput too 
some people they they may have to write your model some people they may have go and uh, write some validation logics too right and uh, it doesn't show that bad as you know the other code looks like because you know um that code piece has that validation on the top of it right how that implementation would work installing the package fluent validation dot asp net core and add this validation rule i'll show you how this works <clears throat> fluent validation validator okay so you see this class um i actually made one of the validator which is a rule for product class where the product name and the product category they cannot be null so i just defined it not null and whenever it will be null it will raise an message which says name cannot be null so i can customize this message as well so again let me set this once again the startup project run it through <clears throat> and we'll take that api all right so try it out let's say product name is again cap but this time i'm giving this value as null um hold on i guess i had validation on what product name and product category okay all right so product category i'm putting this product category as a null and execute all right you see this the product category field is required so that's how that validation works right great we are moving so fast thank you um all right the next is benchmark.net <clears throat> again what is benchmark um benchmarking we are actually using this tool for measuring the performance of your application so if you um if you are not sure about you know how your application is performing sometime it gets slow sometime you know it is fine working with them uh, the other machines but not on your you can you know um, put that benchmarking library into your code and it does support in the dotnet framework dotnet core and mono and why you need it because <clears throat> you know there is always a scope of improvement you can go ahead and assess your application and boost your performance so let's say you know if i being you know human person i have some disease until unless i don't know you know what is the problem going on i cannot take you know the right corrective measures or medicines so in similar way you go ahead use the benchmark.net assess your application and boost the performance you will surely you know get some of the points at least you will be amazed to see it and uh, <clears throat> um it also has i mean uh, the feature to create your own benchmark and analysis tool so that it can fulfill your requirement right and uh, this is pretty much accurate and reliable so that you can use it and uh, you know based on this you can take some decisions and it is highly customizable and extensible okay so how do we do it this is the implementation installing the package benchmark.net this works in console application only so <clears throat> let's once again go here this is a console application set up startup release you know i can do debug to run <clears throat> all right i'll show you what what was written here in this console app um all right so in this program i just you know run this benchmark runner but what is my benchmark this is the class um <clears throat> i just created one random um you know constant and uh, i put it in sha 256 and md5 and comparing these two two things how they are performing right 
and it will now start comparing it. It is working. So hold on. So the when the non optimized most probably okay. This has to be released. I'm sorry, my bad. Console once again. Uh continue debugging. And here you go. <laughs> So this is actually, you know, running um, these two methods, which was a um, MD5 and SHA256, and will put you and give you the result how they are performing. So it gives you these things. Going and going. All right, we'll take some more time. <clears throat> cool, it's about to complete, I guess. Yeah, all right. So here is the result, right? So it will say, you know, what are the methods? So this is the method SHA 256 and MD5, we used it. Uh, it gives you result in three um, three parameters, which is the mean error and standard deviation. So this is the mean of this method would be you know 5.201, and MD5 will be 16.022. Uh, the chances of getting error or um, the parameter for this value is 0.438, and for MD5 is 2 0.2618, and the standard deviation. For SHA256 is 0 0.0410 and for MD5 is 3015. So you can clearly see this, you know, these are the some of the values it throws, and based on this, you can you know see uh, how the performance is going on. All right, good. So mini profiler. Again, uh, <clears throat> there is an open source library on the NuGet packages mini profiler, ASP.NET. Core MVC that profile the, that provides you know the profiling functionality, and again you know this is supporting a broad way of you know the frameworks which is .NET framework, .NET Core, Mono, and an easy integration with the other .NET frameworks and libraries. Uh, why Mini Profiler? It actually gives you a real time feedback, and uh, uh, that actually helps a lot to understand okay where the application is um, going on or lacking on right. So. I remember that we used to you know, have a SQL profiler which runs over the SQL statements only and it gives you, you know which query is taking so much of time and where it gets stuck or something. But <laughs> it is more than that because it allows you a customization to set your own profiling. Along with this, it includes your um, uh, profiling for SQL queries, HTTP request and any custom code blocks, right? So. I'll just show you how that implementation would happen. Is install that package when you profiler a.asp.net core mvc and these are the configuration, some other things. You can take a screenshot and you know use it. Um let me go back to the application once again. Profiler. Mm, controller. Where does it go? Just a minute. Um. Yeah. Ask us how to interrupt. You have got about a couple of minutes. Oh, okay. 
So, all right, no worries. I mean, um, without running, I can, you know, at least, you know, go through with that slide so that uh, that point can be covered, right? So let me go through with these slides. So mock, uh, what is mock? Mock is something, um, <clears throat> you know, um, we are creating our own classes and within the classes, there are different, different methods and sometimes they are dependent on one after another. But in the unit test cases, um, if you have to run those methods, unless until you send those dependencies, those objects, it is very difficult to you know test those um, methods. So mock, what it does, it actually helps us to create a mockup objects for those methods which are dependent on some other um, objects. And that's how you would require for this because that will help you to uh, speed up your unit test cases and you can at least would know that okay this um, method is going uh, very <coughs> uh, this this method is running fast stand correct all right so implementation is install package moq mockup and just use the creating a fake objects uh, in your i'm um, sorry in your unit test cases um mm, allow me a few minutes just a minute let me check where it is all right now i um i can move to the, the other one all right the next one is the poly uh <clears throat> what is poly poly is something which is you know giving you a resilient and transient font fault handling capabilities what happens sometimes your UI that tries to connect with the server, but you know um, that couldn't happen because of you know some of the connection errors, some of the you know the refuses, and something else, right? So poly poly is actually helping over there to you know establish um, that connection. So the problems what the client side is uh, facing is. Um, it could be any kind of circuit breaker or timeout. So if you implement that poly, it can, you know, hit the server at a certain period of time unless until unless it gets the real values or response from there. Um, so that has a built-in policies for the retry, circuit breaker and timeout. You can even, you know, define your own policies handling uh, all those uh, breakers. And uh, it can be used in console, desktop, and ASP.NET web applications. Um, it does support asynchronous, synchronous operations, and you know it has it is uh, easily integratable with other .NET libraries and framework. And the last is SignalR. Sam, I'm going quick. Uh, just allow me two more minutes. So SignalR is what um, it actually provides a very real time web functionality. Uh, basically, it works on the web socket so that it, it connects with the server. So server is actually able to send um, some of the messages to the connected clients. And how does it work? I just wanted to run the last application so that I should not be able to take much more of your time. All right. So... See this so control C so I'm putting my name. So basically, you know, this is very useful for this connected applications like gaming or chatting or you know stock holdings and everything. So this is Bhaskar. I'm saying hi and I'm saying send. So this message is coming now. I'm saying this is Simon saying. Hi, Vaskar, and sending. So see this, I'm switching to the other tab, but it also shows me that message. So it is actually connecting with the other all other clients and sending the message, able to send the message over there. All right, uh, with that said, I guess, you know, I'm done with my presentation once again. Um, thank you and bear with me, uh, <laughs> having, me having me here. I'm